time to dig into emerging tech and the human condition. I'm Jeremy Gilbertson. Along with me, as always, is Mark Fielding. Mark, how are you, sir? Hello. I'm good. Yeah, it's 4.30 here in, in the afternoon, don't forget. So my, my day is over. Um, I'm very well. It's been one of those weeks where, where you wake up and it's Thursday afternoon and you haven't done half of what you aimed to do at the beginning of the week. But since we last spoke, I, did, I was eligible for the Arbitrum airdrop. So go me. Amazing. Amazing. You know, I never yeah. thought about this. So we, we could be, this could be an experiment in energy mismatch too, because I'm coming fresh off two cups of coffee. I'm fired up. I did some writing this morning. I'm ready to dive into a conversation. You're kind of coming down from the day. So yeah. maybe we'll, maybe we'll capture some data somehow with some wearables, but uh, anyway, <laughs> Uh, let's, let's, without further ado, let's introduce our guest. Uh, today we're ex super excited to have John Evershed with us, um, has an amazing background in, in, in media in technology and storytelling and all of that fun stuff. Um, John, welcome to the show. And if you could give us just a little bit of background, kind of pre trioscope kind of who you are, what you've been doing, why you're psyched about this area, why you've always been in it. And then we can kind of dive in. Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Jeremy, Mark. Um, Jeremy and I have known each other for roughly a year now, and, and Mark, I just met this morning. So uh, That, that happens really often. Yeah. Jeremy yeah. knows everybody. I, I don't really know where you are, Mark. Where are you? Uh, I'm in the French Alps, south of France. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my background prior to Trioscope was... For all intents and purposes, I ran a, an animation studio um, called Mondo Media. Um, we probably produced, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of minutes of, of animation for for uh, teens and young adults. Um, pro, you know, had a big audience, built a big audience on YouTube to scale, uh, moved some of those projects from YouTube into television. Um, and uh, always kind of at that intersection of technology and entertainment, my career has always been sort of on that tip and uh, um, more recently, you know, um, started to started to look at the adult animation market, which had grown considerably in the last five, 10 years where it became like a market unto itself almost um, with a lot more of the streamers um, buying into it because they realized that it, it, it built big audiences. And so started to, you know, service that um, streamer business. And that brought me to where I am today with Trioscope. Amazing. Amazing. Quick shout out to brand guru Nolan Ether in the chat. Good to see you out there, Nolan. Um, John, quite a, quite a, quite a storied um, uh, time in this, in this world and at this intersection. What patterns have you noticed um, over the course of a lot of the, how the industry has evolved from like traditional to streaming. Now we're going into a whole new direction. What yeah. patterns do you think are really important in media and technology that are recognizable, or at least that have been to you over time? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, uh, there's a tendency for, for, for power to concentrate in the entertainment industry. Um, and what happened was with the onset of, of the big social video sites, it kind of atomized but it didn't quite atomize the way that I thought it would in that it kind of ended up as a vlogger. I call it a vlogger ghetto. I mean, the only content that kind of works is this content that we're making right now, point a camera and talk to it. Um, you know, you, you might go out and, and fall off a building or, or, you know, do something death defying, but in effect, that's what it has become is, is it, you know, it's a great thing. Don't get me wrong, but I had this vision that, around these big social video sites would be these large studios feeding into it a little bit like the cable system. So I had that classic problem of fighting the wrong war. You know, I thought that, 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 that there would develop these, you know, power centers around it, but in really all it did was it enabled people to, you know, with charismatic personalities to, um, you know, ba basically deliver themselves to a massive audience. And I think there's just a lot more to storytelling than that. Um, it's, it's one way to tell a story. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't particularly interest me as much as where I think the possibilities of things are going. In other words, so we had this explosion, right, with, with YouTube. And 
I was trying to like build a, a really, really big audience on that thing and struggle with it because the algorithms were almost fighting against me, like with this kind of old fashioned idea of a branded entertainment channel with different shows on it. It was just kind of an impossible thing to deliver in that in that environment. And uh, what happened, though, at the same time was, you know, when when the big streamers came along, Netflix came along, and kind of proved that people wanted really high quality, dramatic, long form entertainment. I mean, that's a massive revolution in the last few years, right, that that just didn't exist before. Um, and we're sort of at peak t television at the moment when, you you know, just economically, the, 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 they were all competing for turf and they overspent. And now Wall Street's saying nah, uh, uh, that's like that. Whatever you guys are doing isn't quite working right. So now along comes kind of Web3 AI, you know, some of these developments. And I, I sort of foresee us getting a set of tools. What I'm getting to here is that Triascope is a set of tools that empower everybody from like the most elite filmmakers to the to a, a kid in their bedroom. Um, in other words, the power to tell really, you know, blockbuster, high quality stories set in beautiful environments with all the, you know, effects and stuff that, you know, you've grown accustomed to, but literally on your phone, like you can, you can sit there and make a movie on your phone and deliver to your friends, either in social or if you're more serious about it, you know, produce stuff for, for real audiences and get, and get to some scale there. So that's sort of how I see it as this kind of, uh, you know, implosion, explosion, kind of implosion, explosion. And we're, we're on the cusp right now of an explosion. Uh, it'll probably reconcentrate again, as it always tends to, right? Um, but uh, I sort of see it as kind of, uh, you know, I guess it's one of those theories of the universe that there's one of those theories that they, you know, blow up, contract, blow up, contract. And I think that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Again, I feel like we're at the really nascent stage of of that, that you know, universe about to explode again. Re yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was just very interested in like the patterns and the, the the evolution, the cultural evolution that you mentioned about it all becoming about, well. So when you said like charismatic people in front of the camera, it reminded me of me and Jeremy. But did that did that happen? Why do you think that happened? Was that the 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 handful of media giants pushing that cultural change? Was it a human desire for short form video contact content that created it? Like, why do you think it? came about in the, uh, over the last uh, well, decade th there's a few revolutions in there so it depends which one you're speaking to but i know for a fact that the youtube one i remember sitting down with this engineer and he a uh, youtube engineer and he explained to me how the algorithm was going to work and i immediately thought like god damn it like i am not going <laughs> to operate in that environment it's too chaotic it's too it's too um uh dependent on on vulgarity or, uh, you know, uh, kind of gross stuff or whatever the hell it just, it was sensationalism kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, That's yeah. a better word. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it just was like, you know, it's hard to really tell a story in that environment, like where you build characters and you build a, a, a through line and all that stuff. I thought that that was, um, that was my experience of YouTube. Now this more recent, explosion with really high quality dramatic programming for for the um streamers i think it's it's a little bit of it's a good i don't know if it's just that the industry got increasingly more and more sophisticated and they were comfortable with niche programming that res really resonated with a fairly sizable audience but maybe not everybody in the world like they broke that sort of um he he hegemony of you know a uh, very few networks um, trying to deliver to, you know, I remember watching the last episode of MASH. That's how effing old I am. I love MASH. I love yeah. it. <laughs> watch it now. It's impossibly horrible oh, to yeah. watch. Is it? Okay. Yeah. It's rough. Um, but uh, that thing, I want to say, had 60 or 80 million people, you know, watching it. You know, they were trying to program to to this mass, mass audience. And they were conditioned to program to trying to find another 10 million, you know? Um, and I think that's sort of, you know, I, I think it's pretty interesting, right? You think about like the sixties and television, the fucking streets were on fire and people were raging. L look at like an hour of TV. It was dopey and 
almost naive squeaky and... squeaky clean man yeah squeaky yeah clean. but I mean, so you'll it... know this then john so with mash from i was reading something about syndication just yesterday yeah. and he was talking about mash wasn't made for mass syndication but it was one of the, kind of the last shows that wasn't and i don't know at what point it was maybe late 70s early 80s where studios were making for syndication not for necessarily the quality of of the program is, is that true and is that something which kind of started this that was the first kind of step in the road to where we are well i i think that's a that's an interesting point but i just think there's a long way from that that's quite old that reference um it, you know because you could argue that what happened in television was the the um reality revolution do you guys uh, yeah you still see me uh, it was the reality revolution where it was like, how can we make as much content as possible for l as little as humanly possible? Yeah. You know? Um, so so I think there was that dynamic going on. So, so it's market forces, really, when you think about it, right? Like, and and technology, like the sort of the, the balance of those two things are what creates these changes. And we just got to a place where the streamers were duking it out for subscriptions and were prepared to... Uh, like it was really it was really Wall Street that said, hey, Netflix, it's OK for you to way overspend to because we believe in you as like a tech play. And and that was what enabled them to start that race in motion. But that race is kind of over now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, it, so going back to this, like what, you know, the, the going from like traditional content to YouTube and how that whole thing happened. I think you you not you alluded to it just a little bit, John, but I think it's going to a music reference, the accessibility of the tools to make the stuff um, when musicians could just go to their laptop and they didn't have to go to a big studio and use a tape machine and have an engineer and have yeah. $5,000 vintage mic pre where you could just make a song literally on your iPhone. Now, the democratization uh, and access to those tools is a good thing. But then a whole nother challenge comes up is how do you identify and elevate the really good stuff? in the mass sea of just, you know, yes. what comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I guess good stuff will find, will find an audience. I, I, I'm not a believer that really good stuff just sits there, <laughs> you know, without, without building some type of, uh, cause word of mouth is more efficient than it's ever been. Right. Like, you know, uh, that's one thing we've got going for us in this current environment. Speaking of good stuff, and I know this is we we tend to ask these open ended questions, but like, what is a good story? What is a good? What story? are the what are the key elements to a good story? Great characters, beginning, middle, end. You know, like it's not much more complicated than that. Um, and uh, I guess you know, uh, I've had some experience. Like, I did some interactive game stuff in the uh, '90s where we were doing CD-ROM branching story stuff. We had, we had this game with uh, Tia Carrere from Wayne's World. Remember her, the Asian mm -hmm. girl running around killing aliens in, in this, you know, spaceship. And uh, uh, I really realized at that point, like, oh, this branching storytelling stuff is just not a good thing. It's just not interesting. And um, I wasn't, maybe it's not a personal taste thing. I wasn't interested in it. But I do believe in the power of putting tools in people's hands that um, enable them to tell their own personal, like, like I think a story should have a point of view, right? So if, if you start to inject like thousands of people's points of view into it, I think it starts to kind of just become amorphous and uninteresting. I do believe that like, it, you know, it's, it's a singular person's point of view. You think about the best movies, it's a sing there's a certain singularity to it. It's a team effort, but most, most movies and TV series go wrong because too many people arguably have too much control or the vision itself isn't particularly good. You know, one of the two. And usually it's, it's the latter. Like, it's usually the team effort that Fs it up because the team isn't quite composed right or too many people have inputs and it loses its, um, its essence, you know? The team stuff has always been really interesting to me, right? And I, I go to, like... Uh, for another 80s reference, you know, you go to like the A team, right? The show, the A team. It had mm -hmm. like these yep. specific types of characters that mm -hmm. were part of the mission. And a lot of stories always have those specific types of characters and it's patterns, right? Archetypes yes. and all yep. of that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we sort of have this idea that 
if I could talk about Triosco for a little minute, that, please. Um, storytellers have have stories they can't get made. Even the most elite filmmakers. Uh, when we were, for example, The Liberator, that's a TV series that's on Netflix right now. It's produced using Triosco. They were originally shopping that around like a Band of Brothers kind of project. It was ten fifty million dollars an episode, and they were just getting a lot of no thank yous. But the thing that unlocked it was, oh, we could make it in Triscope, get all the human nuanced performance out of real actors, in this case, in a soundstage, because we shoot in a green screen soundstage. But then we stylize everything so that it look, uh, it, 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 it kind of weaves in with the backgrounds. And this is an important thing. Like I, our contention is that going forward in this sort of metaverse kind of, you know, e world that we're going to enter into here at some point, um, that stylization is, is key to immersing you inside worlds. So you had this project like the liberator, right? Where they couldn't make it as a live action because it was too expensive. They couldn't make it all animation because it was too expensive. What if you merged the two together, but stylized everything to give it like a look, like a graphic novel, like a movie graphic novel. Okay. Now we can afford to make that thing. And that's how it got green lit. So that's at the very elite end for us with Trioscope, right? At the, at, we have a vision for the consumer end. And the, the vision at the consumer end is that if we give the same suite of tools, but sort of, you know, packaged up in such a way that a consumer can use them, we're going to open up a whole new kind of um, form of storytelling where people can use these tools to literally record themselves, embed themselves inside stories, but not arguably not even look like themselves when they're embedded or sound like themselves and make movies, you know, that they can then share on socials or, or, you know, the more serious ones can kind of develop um, uh, genuine entertainment that develops followings and that kind of thing. So that's, we, we sort of see it as a spectrum and we're, we're starting at the high end a little bit like Epic games, you know, started with their tool set, and made it available to lots and lots of people, but they also made like showcase anchor things like we're doing with the likes of, you know, George R. R. Martin or, um, in the, or the liberator, um, where we're working with more sophisticated storytellers to kind of give them this suite of tools to create stories that they wouldn't otherwise be able to create. Could we, um, just like I know that you you two know each other and you you know Trioscope. Can we just back up a little bit for the people who don't actually know? I mean, what what Trioscope is? I mean, like it, it's a hybrid entertainment platform mm -hmm. for creators. That is that correct? That, that's that's correct. Um, it's just uh, think of it like a. First of all, it, it today it works on top of Nuke, which is the compositing software that most you know, film and television uses to composite, you know, two layers together. But um, uh, uh, we're actually working on an Adobe After Effects version that's going to be released here shortly. So you can see how we're kind of moving down that um, that spectrum I talked about. Um, but we shoot in a, in a green screen soundstage. So you can get, you can tackle uh, larger scale projects that have multiple locations or fantastic locations because all of the backgrounds are produced in CG and both of them are treated uh, the same using, using our tools, the background, the foreground to kind of knit the two together, but you can get any number of styles. It could be, you know, anything from like the liberator, which is sort of a graphic novel look or a, or a comic book look to an anime look to um, you know, a uh, 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 Monet painting. You can cut. You have a range of looks um, that you can apply um, to to the projects. Does that work for you, Marcus? Like, I'm yeah, happy to answer any more yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like, um, is it? It sounds more animation than live than live, or is it? Is, it, is that up to the creator and how much animation they want to put on to? Well. Um, we tend to use uh, real actors because you, you know how when you're watching a black and white movie, you understand you're not getting all the information, but you're getting all the emotional information of the performance. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, similarly, with a stylized look, you're getting all the, the nuance of the performance, but the economics are superior 
to shooting, you know, like it's not like we're making a Marvel mo movie for 200 million. We can make a Marvel movie where the actors doing everything that they do, but it's, it's forgiving. This environment's more forgiving when you stylize worlds. It, 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 it's not as pixel perfect as, as like a photo reel um, uh, movie or TV show is. So you get, you still get this nuanced performance of the humans. Now it's not to say we couldn't work with, animation layer, background layer, and knit the two together. And there are some projects that we're looking at to do that very thing. But really, I think where we're, we're best is sort of capturing the human performance and putting it into a world that's affordable. You know, you can, sh you can, you can be shooting in a, in a soundstage and be, you know, in the, the mid 40s, mid 1940s in a, you know, in Italy. Yeah, a couple couple of interesting call outs to this. Um and, and Sean and Nolan in the chat, we've got some questions popping up. We will definitely get to go get to those. They're really good. Um, but John, one thing that you made me think about, both in the um the kind of large scale, more curated content that you guys release, and then also giving people the access to the tools to create their own content. Mm -hmm. There's a way to step into a world um maybe little by little to blur the line, blur the boundary that exists in making that world believable. And I think because what Trioscope does, having the background a certain way and having the foreground a certain way and this tech to stitch them both together, you're almost kind of unaware that you're in it until you're in it, right? I mean, is that a little bit of the magic maybe that comes out of this stuff? Uh, yeah, you touched on something really, really important is we're, we're envisioning building IP franchises, for example, we have this project called Takeover. It's, it's in post-production. It's set in modern-day Atlanta. It's um, a uh, it's starring Quavo um, from Migos, and we have this Atlanta 3D set in effect, right? So our vision is make the movie now, make that set available along with a suite of tools to allow people to make move, walk into the movie they just watched and make their own movie. That's, that's really compelling because I think that's where this, cool. that's where this technology is going. It's, it's not just web three, but emerging tech in general allows you to maybe on the front end. And I, you guys haven't necessarily done this to this extent, but like kind of pull some of the characters out early before production's even uh, done and let people interact with those digitally. And then, have a persistent world at the end of this instead of everything culminating in like this one thing to watch, right? You're building the world. Why not make yes. it last, right? Yeah. I don't want to pretend it's easy either um, because oh, yeah. it's really hard to kind of, you know, build a world before someone's seen the world, you know, like if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're doing a lot of learning, honestly, and experimentation and, you know, two steps ahead, one step back on that. But yeah, that is the idea is, is that this world can exist independent of the movie and the movie, the movie's like a day in the, the life of this world that we're building. That's, that's much more, much richer. It has sort of um, various factions that are all competing for, you know, control over the, um, the city. It's, it's kind of a high octane car um, based story, uh, you know, set in Atlanta, modern day Atlanta. Nolan, Nolan, you're absolutely right. Fan fiction folks will definitely be losing their mind at, at, at the ability to interact with something on a persistent basis. One quick question for you, John, related to uh, the tech and how it's done. I had, had a few questions from Mark and Nolan about mm -hmm. uh, why green screen and why not kind of unreal virtual production background kind of stuff. Uh, you just can't get performances out of um, unreal characters. I don't care what anybody says. They're still wooden and dead-eyed, and you've got that uncanny valley, uncanny valley problem. Um, now, is that always going to be the case, at least for the foreseeable future? But I do see us, uh, we're already developing for Unreal, like to, to port our technology over to Unreal and Unity. So um, uh, it's on our roadmap, and there will be a point at which we... I think at least capture the motion of the human performance and then apply it to a 3d avatar and, um, and, and possibly even the, you know, use some AI to uh, work the faces inside that environment um, and, and the voices. So I think um, 
you know, we're looking pretty hard at AI right now. We've, we're already sort of, you know, thinking about it from a style application standpoint. Like it's, it, there, there is a, that's on our roadmap and we're doing some early, early tests with it. But uh, keep in mind, like our tools are, tr we're trying to make them to be battle tested and market ready for high end professional filmmaking and AI still is low res it's it's um jittery it, when you when you whenever you try to do anything over time and ours is a very stable way of producing you know actual movies and tv series that you know you could you can um deliver to audiences today it is it, but i i you're i do see a world where we start to move towards um, a 3d avatar approach to these things what so quick clarification on that uh so nolan mentioned uh related to just the backgrounds, not the people themselves or the avatars or the mm -hmm. just unreal in virtual production for oh, the yeah. backgrounds piece instead of the green screen. Yeah, we've already done some of that, but not like LCD, you know, stuff. We're, we're not doing, um, we're not, that's very, really expensive, interestingly. Like it's actually mm -hmm. more expensive than you think. Like you think you're getting all these economies, but it's actually very expensive to do it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, no, it makes sense. On, um, Okay, so so let's talk a little bit more, you know, about a year when we met about a year ago, John, we were talking there's there, maybe a little bit longer than that. It was it's kind of this early, hey, this is web3, this mm -hmm. is NFTs, this is all this stuff is happening and and you were trying to kind of get your head around how how that would apply to Treescope. Let's talk about what you initially thought and then yeah. after this first little swath of nonsense cleared out and now we're seeing where we're going next and it wasn't yeah. all nonsense but it was a lot of hype cycle fomo stuff that we always talk about give me mm -hmm. the first cast and give me where you guys are headed well i was caught up in that early on too like an idiot and um we were starting to develop like a pfp thing right like it's a character driven pro project with these various factions and stuff like that but then we realized like uh this is it's just sort of empty and it's just like a financial play almost it wasn't that interesting we, we've got all these sort of rich rich teams competing for power in this city let's let's kind of go more towards an rpg game um a web 3 rpg game approach um and that's sort of where we we, we settled on and uh, we're in development now on that project. And imagine that, you know, it, I, what I like about it, and I think uh, Mark mentioned this just before this call started, the, the ownership um, aspect of, of Web3. I kind of yeah. wish almost that, that the SEC wasn't, you know, as a, I, w I wish they were lo looked at a little more like crowdfunding. You know, they've, they've made allowances for crowdfunding, right? Where you can go on Republic and raise, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Well, five million, I think, is legally what you can raise from unaccredited investors. But I think that um, I wish that there was a, a pathway where unaccredited investors could invest up to a small amount, you know, um, to uh, open up um, people to, to, to actually have equity in, in, in IP. Um, that really interests me and I don't know, I don't want to take that risk right now because it's just too risky, but, um, at, at a minimum ownership of cards and, you know, the, 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 the sort of a Marvel snap approach, if you will, you know, like, like I, that kind of interests me. And I think it's an aspect, but it's only a gateway into this larger vision, I think of, um, making movies inside movies. I don't know if you've heard of, of, if you know Cameron Van Hoy or the Flinch project, which is a sim used NFT. So there was an NFT drop. And if you bought the NFT, the NFT corresponded to a character in the film that they're, they're making or subsequent films. And mm -hmm. they've taken the film and they're making a metaverse, kind of a little bit like as you've described. And then if you own the NFT, you can then they're going to turn the, the, the metaverse into a film studio based on the premise of the film Flinch. And then if you own the NFT, you can go in, you, you own the IP and you can create stories and world in the Flinch metaverse that's based on the film. But which is a little bit what I think what you were just describing. Mm -hmm. But just so the second that actually prevents that being realistic at the moment, are they actually stopping that kind of um well use of the nft you can't own a um 
what's it called? The Huey test or something? Howie there, test. Howie, Howie test. test. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are certain things that uh, forbid you from selling equity in, in IP. You, you can, however, um, allow people to make their own content or or slap it on a T-shirt and 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 sell it. That that's that's actually allowable, permissible. But anything that gives you like par, a par, partitional, you know, growable equity in inside an entity is uh, off limits. So I, so, I've, I've had a, I've had a thought on that, just a quick follow up. And this is for, you know, just one of my own projects that I'm building related to music that uh, in music, you have what's called a producer credit. Like if, if you guys are in the studio uh, working on a song and you're doing some stuff and I come in for an afternoon and I'm like, Hey, you know, Mark, why don't you flip the arrangement around on this and invert your chords instead of doing it the other way. And then Mark's like, Hey, that's rad. That works. Hey, I'll give you a little piece of the song. Right. That's ownership in the song, right? That's ownership. That's so I'm looking for old use cases that currently apply. How could we reapply those similar scenarios, right? You, I, you know, I it's really funny, Jeremy. I had the exact same thought. I really truly did. I said, Hey, what's the difference between being attached as a producer? Because a lot of producer credits in movies are just uh, you know, spiffing somebody that needs to get taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a part, it's a it's proportional participation, right? There's no difference. Now they contributed work towards that that, right? Like is your point. And that th that that was the guidance I got from the lawyers. Well, if 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 your fans contribute to the thing, then maybe you could that that would be a, a permissible way to go at it. But um uh I, th I think at the moment it's going to be dangerous to like play on that, on that line. Especially in a big, big project with a lot on the line. If you have yes. like a little thing that you can spin up that could easily be yeah. devolved and unraveled as an experiment in, you know, that's okay. Because what's happening, if you look at Dow's, there was a recent ruling. I don't, I think it might've been in a UK court, Mark where the um uh the dow the dow members were actually um assigned as or 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 they were called trustees or like had fiduciary responsibility for the treasury and that's a big that's a big decision because before that if you were just a member of a dow you could just kind of fly it in and do your thing and spin out but now it's like oh wait so if i'm a member of a dow now am i Am I holding the bag of the treasury oh. as well? So it's a that yeah. was a big ruling, right? And we're going to start seeing a lot more of those uh, related to that. But you're right. I'm going to, again, every show, we're going to end up saying bi-directional value exchange at some point. But that's exactly what we're referring to, John, is the, is the idea that if I, if I, uh, if there's a relationship between me and the production, I give the production something that's valuable to the end result. Mm -hmm. Then there's an exchange. Then you give me remuneration for that, for that, uh, involvement. Yeah. I could imagine like, you know, with, with a piece of music that you just say, okay, everybody in the community, you're going to contribute one note, right? Yep. You're going to contribute one note. And, uh, <laughs> it's, well, it's a little seven. weird, right? <sighs> yeah. Hey, here's, here's, here's our free idea of the day. So if anyone's heard of nouns, Dow, how they just started releasing nouns as NFTs and they've done all kinds of stuff. We're going to start, uh, we're going to start a music note down. Today's note is C major. There you go. Bam. It's out there. Today's note. Whoever wants yeah. to buy it can buy it. Tomorrow's yeah. will be D right. I don't yeah. know. It's funny. Short project. That's right. <laughs> I know short project. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, this, it, this it's is kind of, but that, it's almost like the, the ownership question, the own, the kernel of all of, well, a lot of NFT and a lot of web is is ownership. And it feels from what you're saying that that is actually, we're actually as far away from that as we ever were. And in fact, there was a, a little bit of hubris last year about it. And in fact, the reality is that not a lot has changed really in terms of ownership. Yeah. Uh, that's my, my sense of things. Um, again, I did, I did a little work in crowdfunding and there are, as long as you're a certified site, like, you know, Republic or whatever, then you can, you can run a raise through them as a certified site, but you can't just, you know, decide to crowdfund on your own without one of these certified sites doing all the due diligence that 
needs to get done. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. So Sean had a had a good question. We went down the AI track for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, how how do you think that will affect um, the balance between like human driven creativity and you know computer driven creativity? And and how do you see the balance happening over the over the next few years? Well, uh, today right now. We just produced a deck for a, a big pitch. It was like a $40 million feature, all in AI. So you can see right now that like all that, all that work that would have otherwise been farmed out to con- concept artists um, was handled by, you know, somebody sitting in their uh, office bedroom, you know, making a deck. Um, a fraction of was the that, time. Was that, co- time. Was that copy or visual? Visual. Okay. Visual. Yeah. Okay. I might sound old and creaky, but I don't believe that, that there just will be AI generated storytelling. You know, it, it, it might, it, it'll be a novelty thing. And I just think point of view, it, you know, you lose point of view. Like I, uh, like I, I did a lot of work in comedy, right? Um, I, I, I struggle to imagine how AI is going to get, you know, that strong of a point of view because it was always point of view that would would seal the deal for what is a show that has enough legs to actually work. Um, and there was, a, and there was, and, and so where I do see it though is in um, production efficiency, um, style application, motion application. I just, I think that it will just empower individuals like this democratization thing we've been talking about on that spectrum to create their own uh content uh you know that preserves that vision as you know i still think that 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 has to be there but it'll just it's just it just will give everybody really powerful tools for making really compelling and here i'm thinking of like actual storytelling not not you know, the Pope in a puffy coat, you know, like that's really cool. And it blew around the world two times, you know, mm-hmm. b- before anybody figured out that it was a lie. Um, that, uh, that AI will, will just be a powerful suite of tools that will allow you to get to your vision of what you're trying to make a lot faster. I'm, I'm curious your guys' point of view though, wh- whether you share that or you have a different perspective storytelling storytelling the the word storytelling has been hijacked by content creators doing things that aren't story but just a a different thing to that when you spoke about ai and jokes i actually so i when ai when chat gpt first came out i thought i know i can do an ai joke book put on amazon like the five five hundred ai jokes and just do it in like an hour and put on amazon that would be great yeah and i quickly AI couldn't tell a joke. They, 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 it couldn't create a joke. It was stealing jokes. Yeah. And I looked into it, and I think Nolan is in the chat, and he'll know more than me on this, but AI can't work backwards at the moment. So with a joke, you need a punchline, and you, and you work back from the punchline to create a story that makes that punchline a shock or amusing or emotional, whatever it is that makes the joke funny. And at the moment, AI can't work backwards. But it will be able to soon, apparently. And, we, yeah. and then it will be able to create jokes. I know. Um, I, I, may, may, maybe maybe um, writers will be vulnerable. Oof, I don't know. I, I'm I, just curious if you guys, how you think about it. Yeah, I, I hope I, not. Yeah, I know, That's right? Right, Mark? Yeah, no doubt. No, I'm I, screwed. I, so I, I agree with you. Um, John, on, on the fact that, that, that this tech could be can make things more efficient and help people develop these stories, develop these visuals, develop. But it's all got to start with something that's innately human. And G, uh, AI is not innately human yet. They haven't lost a parent. They haven't seen a son go off to war. They haven't grown up poor and struggled through a rags to riches story, right? Like all mm-hmm. of these things are... Are, are innately human could they be learned maybe but could they be learned with the nuance of humanity that's that's the big thing and you know what what humanity is in general and not to go too deep into a spirally rabbit hole but like the idea and the tension that humanity has with kind of being themselves as uh, the record difference between us and animals right a dog does it or a cow doesn't necessarily have self-awareness 
per se, right? I do, but they built, but the reason I have self-awareness is causing a lot more problems. Humans, Pandora box and the whole nine yards. And the general tension between those two is what I think makes human storytelling important. Can I ask you a question following on that then? And something that John and we spoke right about at the beginning and our, my eternal challenge with a lot of this is when you give the tools to the masses, 99% of the masses don't know how to write a story, don't know how to create a story, don't know how to create a world. So the que- does the question about AI become obsolete because AI doesn't need to replace the creme de la creme of storytellers. It doesn't need to replace, and it might not have a place because of the nuance that the best storytellers in the world who work for the best IPs in the world, but it will replace the 99% who, who, are, who are rubbish. Well, I might take issue with 99%. Okay, like I, yes, think there's, I think there are more storytellers than, than that. Um, yeah. It's just that they haven't been given you know, a powerful enough tools to, to enable them to tell the kind of stories that they'd like to tell. The, 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 if you think about it, right, like there's, there's the element of the new, never seen before. Like it's all referential, right? Like current AI it just looks at everything we made so far and it goes, here's the optimal version of, you know, a Western story, you know, set in the 1800s. But that's not new. Like that's just all it's it's I guess it's new because it's just resorted, shuffled the deck and come up with a a variation of a bunch of westerns. But it's not like a sci-fi western. You know, I guess you could you could type in I want a sci-fi western and you get you get but I, I think you'll get a lot of very derivative a, re, a lot of really derivative ref, you know, referenced ideas, even if they're cumulatively add up to something, they're not brand new. And no. we do respond as humans to new. You get a sci-fi Western with Will Smith in it. That's what you get. And then you're yeah. not good. Yeah. Speak, speaking of sci-fi Westerns, uh, Nolan had another question related to what you've been doing with George R. R. Martin. And I know you can't talk about a lot of this stuff, but I know there's one project that's already out there that you could talk about, right? Yeah. Well, well, you know, think about George R. R. Martin, right? One of, arguably one of the most powerful, you know, p- folks in Hollywood at the moment. And he had this whole series of short stories that he wanted to get made, but it wasn't clear how to make them. And then when he looked at our technology, he, he recognized, oh, I could make a lot of this, this anthology that I want to do inside um, in using our technology. And so um, we set up with him and we produced uh, the first one was was called Night of the Cooters. Um, it is a sci fi Western. Um, it's uh, about uh, uh, some aliens that descend into this small town. It's like a half hour long um, piece of work. And it's just really fun because it's kind of magical. It's, it's, it was easy to produce because we were able to recreate like this West classic Western town. And we had the alien spaceship land in it. And uh, he really loved it. Like he loved it so much that he started to commission additional episodes in, in his anthology. And we're producing those now as we speak. Um, so, um, I think, uh, you know, and, and, and we've just developed a really good relationship with him because, you know, he tends to, he tends to gravitate towards fantasy and, you know, large scope kinds of storytelling. And I think our tools just really suited, um, what he was doing and we've developed a really good relationship with him. Yeah. We'll, we'll put the links to that, to that stuff in the chat too. That was a, that was a fun one. I think, uh, uh, who directed that? Was that Vincent D'Onofrio? Did yes. he direct that? He started in it too, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 it, and it's just, it's actually, you know, not a full realization of our tech. Like it's come along quite a bit, even since, since we made that. And uh, we're pretty excited about this new Adobe After Effects version of it coming out. Cause that's got a larger, much larger base than, uh, than, than Nuke, which is the current platform we're built on. So yeah, and that, that's 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 uh, and it's really blossoming blossoming into all kinds of rela- all kinds of new projects and stuff like that that we're developing with him. Amazing, amazing. Well, I think we're we're getting close to uh, our time to land the plane here, John. Um, okay. What's 
what sort of things are, are up and coming that you want to tell everybody about related to the commercial, the, 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 the high level Trioscope studio version and kind of what the consumer experience may look like with that uh, over time? Well, at the high level, you know, we'll be coming out with this takeover feature. Uh, we don't have a distributor yet, um, but we'll probably start to um, uh, screen it at festivals, I would say, in the fall, winter time frame here this year. And then um, the takeover world that goes along with that, which is, uh, you know, a Web3 project that we, we discussed earlier, um, is coming out in parallel with that movie. And then um, we've got uh, uh, the, on, the, on, the, on the sort of tools end, we've got this Adobe After Effects version coming out. And then we're moving on to, as I said earlier, um, uh, the version for... Um, sorry, the version for um, uh, uh, Unity and Unreal. <laughs> that took a while to get out. Um, and uh, so, so those are probably the most, you know, immediate things in our, in our future. Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so whoever hasn't checked out Trioscope yet or seen anything in Trioscope, it's definitely something to, to look into and, and peek at from a, sp from a storyteller's perspective, from an audience's perspective. Uh, they've been doing some really great stuff over time. Uh, Mark, do you have any other questions for John or anything, any closing thoughts? Can, can we all agree that the A-Team was about Murdoch? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he was that Murdoch and the van. Um, um, no hot burns. Uh, what are you reading at the moment, John? If I could ask, what are you reading? What are you watching? And um, yeah, what are yeah you, I'm, what are you watching? I'm watching Succession. I love that series. And you talk about peak TV, right? That to me is like that sort of pinnacle of quality storytelling and and um, and just the the richness of the the you know aesthetically, it's it's handsome. Um, Hopefully it's not the last of this phase we're in, right? It's quite so, a long phase. Would you say it's been running since kind of Sopranos and... Yes. Yeah. Is the X-Files in that? Am I, I'm just, I was a, an X-Files nerd in the 90s. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because <laughs> we're working with Howard Gordon, um, who's the executive producer of that. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, and um, he's, uh, he's actually um, on our advisory board. Um, but uh, X-Files... Um, uh, you know, yes, arguably, um, I, I'm not an X-Files guy, so I really can't speak to. Okay. Um, succession though. I, I haven't seen it. Do you watch that, Jeremy? I'll have to, oh, a yeah. lot of people yeah, yeah. say it's brilliant. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a little bit meta too. Cause it's kind of about like networks and stuff too, where like television business in general. So it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. Great. Well, uh, John, okay. thank you so much for, for taking the time and jumping in. Always great to see you. I know you're an early bird out there in San Francisco. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for jumping in so <laughs> early. Uh, yeah. Mark, always a pleasure to see you guys. You too, and yeah. uh, viewers out there, everyone in the chat, everyone checking it out. Keep, uh, keep us on the dial, so to speak, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. Bye-bye.